RF man here. Today I want to talk about inductors, specifically about the saturation point of an inductor. And what I have here is a test circuit that I built. It's actually a fairly simple circuit. This is the schematic diagram and this is the actual breadboard version. And what you can do with this particular circuit is you can measure the saturation point of an inductor. Typically inductors are rated for a specific current and we all know that there's different materials, different magnetic materials, ferrite materials that are used, different gauge wires and number of turns etc. Uh, but one of the important characteristics of an inductor, uh, for example this type, okay, is the properties of the core the core material. So what we normally see in our data sheets when we look at the specifications is the initial permeability. And the relationship between permeability and inductance is pretty simple. The higher the permeability, the higher the inductance. So for each turn of wire, your inductance will increase actually four times per turn and if the permeability of the ferrite material is very high then you'll see inductance will be much higher if the permeability is lower then you'll see the inductance is lower so we're going to actually take a look at three different ferrite materials here these are pretty common types that we all use for our RF amplifiers we see material 61, material 28, and material 43. All these ferrite cores are about the same size, and they all have the same length of wire and same number of turns. So we'll be able to do a comparison between the ferrite materials, look at not only the inductance, but then the saturation point. So this circuit as I said, it's pretty simple. This is the breadboard design right here. And I am testing a small power inductor right now. You can see it clipped on to the alligator clips there. And this is what the waveform looks like on the oscilloscope. So what I'm using to drive this circuit is a function generator, okay, square wave function and I am able to control the duty cycle. So as we increase the duty cycle, which is the top trace, you'll see that the current through the inductor will also increase proportionately. Now I'm using a current probe here, Tektronix current probe, and I just got it clamped on to the lead so I can measure the inductance, I could measure the current and I can look at the saturation point but if you don't have a current probe you can use a current sensing resistor okay and actually put that on the source of the MOSFET transistor that you see there and you can measure across that resistor and that waveform will basically be the same as the current waveform and you can see here what I'm using. Let me just pan back a little bit. It's a 0.1 ohm 10 watt resistor. And if I measure the voltage across there, then Ohm's law, I just have to measure and multiply by 10. Okay, take the voltage that I'm reading, multiply by 10, and that'll give me the current. Okay, but since I have a current probe, I don't need the current sensing resistor. I'm going to go ahead and just measure the current directly so you can see I'm on two amps per division okay that would be the peak current and then if we go to the power supply we can actually look at the DC current as well okay so right now we're gonna go ahead and just increase and decrease the duty cycle so you can get an idea of how this works you see duty cycle of the pulse let me just change the time base so you can see a little clearer there's the individual pulses, it's about 15% duty cycle. 
that's as low as it'll go and as I increase that duty cycle you'll see the current increase okay so let me go back and change the time base again and as we increase this you see that it's very linear okay you can see a nice straight line slope on the oscilloscope let me just pan in there a little bit okay pan out and you can see that it's very linear okay but what happens as we increase not only the peak current but the DC current the core will become saturated and that slope will become nonlinear. okay so let's go ahead and increase the duty cycle and right there where you see you see that knee right there where that break point that's where it's becoming nonlinear. okay so right about there we're reading about one amp dc and remember it's two amps per division okay on the current probe so two four six amps peak okay so that's the point where we're going to see that this core saturates and it becomes very very non-linear we can go ahead and step this down a little bit yeah so so we're talking about right where that knee is is the point where it's non-linear All right, so here we have a chart that shows the saturation point of an inductor. And as we saw on the oscilloscope, okay, an inductor can start out and be very linear, but as we increase the current and the core saturates, it becomes nonlinear. Now, why does it do that? Basically, when it saturates, the flux density drops in, in the core and that causes the inductance to drop and as that inductance drops it causes the current to become nonlinear. you can actually measure the inductance between here and here which is the linear portion of the wave and then you can calculate the inductance between this point and this point which is the nonlinear portion of the curve and we do that by looking at the change in current over the change in time. That's the basic formula. I'm not going to go through a lot of uh, mathematics right now. Just wanted to introduce the general concept. So that's what the curve looks like. So if we go back to the oscilloscope and we take a look at our inductor under test, we're going to increase the duty cycle again. It increases the current. Okay, and then we see the point there where the inductor becomes non-linear. So what I'd like to do now is compare different materials. So as I said earlier I have material 61, material 28, material 43. Okay and each of these have a different permeability. The higher the permeability the higher the inductance per turn of wire. So the permeability for material 61 is 125, that's considered low permeability, and material 28 is 600, that's considered medium permeability, and for material 43 it's 850, that's considered medium to high permeability. So the higher the permeability, the higher the inductance. So what we'll do is we'll start by measuring the inductance of each one on my inductance meter and we'll see if that holds true. Okay, so there's material 61 and we're measuring about 10.6 microhenries there. Okay, now let's take a look. At okay, here's material 28. So remember this has a permeability of 600 so we should be measuring a higher inductance and yes we are it's 33.5 microhenries rounded off all right now the last one was material 43 this had a permeability of 850 and the inductance is around 46 microhenries so we had 10.6 33.5 and we'll call this one 
46 microhenries. So we see that it's true. The higher the permeability, the higher the inductance will be per turn of wire. Now what I'd like to do is actually compare each one using my test circuit and take a look at the saturation points and compare those as well. All right, so here we have material 61. Again, has a permeability of 125. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and take a look at the current waveform. We increase the duty cycle. We keep increasing it. Okay, and we see that this particular material is very linear. I am over five amps right now, and it's a very, very linear response. That was five amps. DC and again we're at 2 amps per division it's about 14 amps peak okay so that's material 61 all right now we're going to go ahead and take a look at my RF output transformer that I use on my LDMOS amplifiers and this is also material 61 and there's approximately 5 amps of uh, DC current flowing through this at full power output and about 14 or 15 amps peak, okay, at a very high voltage. So let's take a look at this waveform. Again, you can see it's very linear. I'm drawing more than 5 amps and I'm actually off the scale on my oscilloscope so so that would be uh, about 16 amps or so 14 to 16 we really couldn't get an accurate measure there because we're off the scale but you can see that it does remain very linear okay now we'll go ahead and take a look at material 28 and material 43 all right so there's material 28 there's where the waveform starts. Seems to be fairly linear. And now as we increase it, you see immediately that instead of a straight line, we have this curve here. Okay, so it's nonlinear at about 2.5 amps. Actually, if you look at that a little closer, yeah, it looks like it becomes nonlinear closer to about a half amp and maybe 5 amps peak. Now we'll look at material 43. This one has the highest permeability, remember 850. And we see that it does start off somewhat linear and then again at about maybe 1 amp or so. You can see there Okay, it starts to become very nonlinear and just continues as we increase the current. All right, so what does all this mean? We've looked at basically the saturation point of an inductor. We uh, looked at the saturation point of three different materials, materials 61, 28, and 43, and we compared them. And I think that this shows why for high powered amplifiers, we generally like to use material 61. Here's my output transformer there, which is also material 61, because the saturation point is very, very high. And the current waveform remains very linear. And this gives us a very good linearity on the output of our amplifiers. Okay, if we use materials like 28 or 43 where we have a high power output, we're going to go ahead and saturate that inductor or saturate the core, which will cause the flex flux density, excuse me, to drop, and that would cause the inductance to also drop, and that causes the curve to become very nonlinear. So I just wanted to uh, show this as a demonstration so we can understand why different core materials are used for different applications. So thank you very much.
RF Mac.